computer. Now, kia ora. So this is a chance for us um, as a panel to answer some of the questions that um, were posted from the webinar um, from the Family Violence Death Review Committee's webinar that was held in collaboration with the New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse. Um, we have three of our original panellists um, that have returned for this, um, Nicola, Jane and Tim. Um, we're also joined by um, a, a, one of our committee members, Michael Raguski from uh, Kaitiaki Research and Evaluation. Um, and I'm Pauline Gulliver, um, Senior Specialist at um, the Health Quality and Safety Commission. So I'm going to pose the questions and our wonderful panellists are going to respond to them. Um, in association with this uh, uh, recording, we'll also post some written responses to uh, some of the questions that were answered um, as we're not going to have time to get through them all. Um, but we are immensely grateful for all the questions that were posed during the webinar and um, apologies it has taken us a wee while to get to this point. Um, so Tim, just to start with you, uh, one of our first questions was how do we most effectively challenge ideas of manhood at a national level? What are the most effective messages for us to get out there to create ideas of manhood that men and boys want to ascribe to, but are not always about being in control? Yeah, kia ora team. Um, yeah, well, one of the things I was thinking about with this question actually is around what the um, terminology around masculinity has uh, defaulted to in recent times. And we often talk about toxic masculinity. And I think that um, the danger of that is that um, for a lot of men, um, they see it as a kind of like a blame culture to men. And like, you know, so that it, it actually um, excludes them in the, in the conversation. So they kind of get that negative reaction. So I think talking more about um, encourage, encouraging men to embrace you know, the full range of masculinity and actually masculinity includes a whole range of things, some of which are healthy and some of which are unhealthy. And we need to, I suppose, understand the full context of that and the unhealthy parts, um, understanding, you know, where they come from and how strong is that model for us and, and our being, and then how does it impact on, on the context of our current behavior? Um, and so taking that kind of more inclusive approach, I suppose, that connects them as men in a kind of, I suppose, a little bit like the work that we do with men, trying to say, take that non-judgmental approach, but trying to encourage men on the learning journey for themselves to sort of think about what is it about being a man for me, you know, how do I make sense of that? And then, and then how does that um, impact on how I behave in myself and how that influences my connection with others? Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, Nicola or Michael, did either of you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I suppose my, um, my contribution would be to encourage us to think about that question within the context of the sort of uh, masculine and feminine dynamic and interrelationship because I don't think that we could really fully support um, a reflection on um, you know perceptions of manhood without looking at that within the context of perceptions of womanhood um, uh, and the roles that uh, we are all um, socialized continue to be deeply socialized within and how that socialization as a, as a girl and a woman plays in a very um, reinforcing dynamic with um, those who are grown up as boys um, and, and become men. Um, so obviously the question of, you know, the masculine and feminine is recognized now as being far less binary um, and the conversation is more deeply around gender. Um, but I think that it's one that has to involve us all. Michael? Uh, the only thing I could add is that there is space here within governmental strategy to actually look at how these messages could um, roll out at a local community level, um, but also provincial and national. Like, um, I think there is a role to play for government in supporting um, a move away from these messages. And we also know that there is a, a link between alcohol and um, and our sporting culture, and I think there's real um, need to de-link those sort of activities. Not that sport in itself is bad, but there are some aspects of sport that have been held up um, 
which can distort masculinity. And we, I think we really need to have a, a conversation as a nation about those and delink anything that supports those this sort of things. Sport should just stand on its own. Excellent, thank you, Tame. Um, so Nicola, the short-term interventions favoured is the um, favoured option as it's cheaper. And um, we all know that longer term interventions are more effective and long lasting. So what can we do to make funders and agencies more aware of this as well as changing this at a governmental level so that they can see the benefit for Aotearoa and make the funds, uh, the necessary funds available um, to be able to do this much needed work? Mm. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, there's, there's so many responses to this question, but one is that if we do all know that longer term interventions are more effective, then we need to be much more proactive in bringing that evidence to the forefront of our discussions about what um, models of practice we should be developing and the competences required to develop uh, those practices. I don't think for me it's necessarily as simple as it needs to be longer rather than short. Central to the question of how long is effectiveness? Um, and the need for uh, uh, models of practice and service options that are personalised, that are adaptive and responsive, um, that are able to recognise and um, be flexible to needs and risks and issues and strengths and opportunities as they arise, not only for the individual but also within the context of, 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 of Farno. Um, that's why um, I think it's really important you talked about language during the uh, during the seminar. I think it's really important that we shift away from using terms like program, because they are all not what I've just talked about: adaptive, responsive, personalised, um, flexible. Um, I think there's a quite an embedded um, mindset around programs and content and delivery um, and compliance that is connected deeply with the social services relationship with the judicial system. Um, and there's perhaps a little bit more to say um, about that um, as well. I think there's a conundrum for uh, um, NGOs because um, obviously there's a, a real, you know, need to, um, you know, sustain income sources and those income sources are commonly attached to short-term um, contract. But that binds us also in the same, um, limitation that individuals and whānau are bind in. It undermines organisational um, development and resilience just as it undermines personal development and whānau development and resilience. At the end of the day, um, I think that if we want to encourage a shift towards more holistic um, and futuristic um, models of practice, um, NGOs need to stand up and perhaps take a more forthright role in um, setting out the limitations that the short-term funding model as it is connected directly to the effectiveness of um, uh, practice for families. Um, mm. Thanks, Nicola. Um, Michael, did you have anything to add? Um, uh, you're right, Nicola. This is, there are so many layers to this question. Mm. And, um, and for me, when we look at the chronology of events leading the, 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 the man who has experience with violence into a program, for instance, is generally through the courts. So it's not just about a question of short term versus long term. Mm. People have enormous problems having accessing support to um, move away from violence. It's wrong. I think it's really a, a terrible indictment on our country that the majority of people access non-violence programs because of a court order. Yeah. So we need to sort of have a cast of, I don't know if it's the right metaphor, cast the net wider or start thinking differently about providing um, support early, um, but also um, without having to go through a court system. I was in Auckland and to be, do a self-referral to um, one program was costing someone $1,500. So they had identified that they had a need. Um, they, they hadn't engaged in physical violence, but they had engaged in emotional um, and psychological violence, but they wanted to nip it in the bud as soon as possible. So they needed to pay $1,500. A lot of people can't do that. The other thing I just wanted to say too is that as a language, we as a country are focusing on programs. It's almost like put someone in a program, it's quite 
they're dealt with. And I think there are, we need to have multiple responses of which a program is one, but we really need to start thinking about how we can do things differently to support nonviolence at a local community level so we can actually start providing supports and interventions at that stage as well. It's not just about sending on some, someone to a program. Um, Tim, can I invite you into the conversation? Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, what Nicola and Michael said. And I think, um, yeah, that whole uh, program response, you know, is the traditional model. And I mean that in here, at, we, we run the Men's Centre here and the, the longest standing group we have is not government funded. Um, and it's the group that people can stay in, in and out of as long as they want to or need to. And as long as it takes, you know, to be able to embed, embed the change. And we get men who, come intensively for a while and then and then we don't see them and they get on a good track, but then they come back when they need a check in and, and update and when they've had a learning or they've come up with another challenge. But we're still there, you know, I think that's the main thing. And like Mike said, you know, it's not necessarily a programme, but often a programme of action. So, you know, there's a number of um, pieces of the puzzle and they often will be different. So what we tend to do traditionally is you go, go to a non-violence programme mainly the same content for a group of different, you know, a different group of people who come from a different journey to that point, which kind of assumes you're just going to get this package, you know, whereas, and it might hopefully fit with a few of you, but it probably won't fit with all of you, and you'll have to wait until the part that does fit with you to come around on the program menu, versus actually being able to respond to the individual needs in a, in a much more flexible way. Yeah, so, um, that's my, my thoughts here. Um, Jane, did you want to add anything to that? No, okay. Um, so my next question is um, to you, Michael. Um, there are, are these models of power and control working for our Māori men? Are there holistic Māori models? Um, where does cultural connectedness, understanding and competency fit within the need for changing behaviours? It's a large question. It's a hard question. So um, first of all, no, they're not working for Māori men, but models that are based on a power and control model, such as the Duluth model, are generally not working for any men. So what we, can, what we do know, there is growing evidence to suggest that rather than a singular program for, on non-violence for the male perpetrator, for instance, at a programmatic level, what works seems to be working very, very well is when um, the NGO looks at the whole of whānau. So um, under a model of keeping everyone safe, that there are parallel um, programs available, for instance, um, where the man who has identified a problem with violence, either self-identified or through the courts, for instance, um, goes on his journey, uh, a supportive journey through either a facilitator, but also sometimes with one-on-one -on -one follow up counseling. But his, let's say it's a female partner, they're also gonna need support, often to understand his journey of transformation and change, because understandably, um, many people don't trust it when their partners start to change, because they've heard that sort of thing before. But also the models that have been working well include um, our babies, our, our tamaiti, and understanding that there's been trauma there and that they need, and so I've seen some programs that, for instance, it'll be a holiday program. So Te Whakarere Hau Mary in Auckland, they have a, a school holiday program, which is all about healing and empowering the young children. Um, but Whakarere Hau um, Māori Women's Refuge in Hamilton, they're doing this extremely well. Kōkere Marae is doing it really, really well as well. But what's also common about all these programs is that they look at basic needs as well. They will also, it's not just about the, the male is perpetrated going to a program. They'll make sure that there's food on the table, that there is a 24-hour case management sort of, I mean, these are my words, case management, but if there is the threat of an eruption of violence, there's someone to call. And so either for that, um, the man who's about to engage in violence to go to someone's house or that that case manager will come to their house and try and 
um, ease the tensions. Um, someone 24 hours, that's been working really, really well. And we can see this with Safe Man, Safe Family as well. So I could go on for ages, but I think what's also important is I think people within Aotearoa are sick of national, international models being placed in New Zealand, where there are many, gr a growing number of initiatives which are doing very well. We need to um, evidence this, we need to gather their stories, because I, I feel when I'm with the community, people are wanting um, examples of excellence that they can look at and adjust <laughs> On locations, they don't want a one size fits all. Um, yeah, did I answer the question there, Pauline? I think you did. Yes, I think you did. <laughs> um, Tom, do you want have anything to answer? Ask um, Ed. Um, yeah, well, I think, like Mike says, I think there's a lot of um, richness in what's around and available to us locally, and and probably locally in our own spaces. So. I think of our experience with using, um, I don't know if it's, the, if it's the right word, but metaphorical ways of representing stuff. So we, Hangi Deepi was our councillor way back, he had a model of the Pātiki model, which is a flounder and tamuri and the difference between where they live. One lives in the sort of dirt and that sort of thing and the other one lives in the clear water. And that was about the journey of change and that was really connected with, our, with a lot of our men because of the um, connection to that whakaaro around those those images, but also, I suppose, connection to maybe activities and things that they might be involved in, as diving and things like that, and fishing. And um, some of the Pudako, I suppose, you can draw, draw on as well from those stories. But I think one of the important things, and it's another tangi tip for us here, is always about meeting people where they are. Because often the, the danger is that we, we make an assumption about somebody's cultural connection because they, you know, and that sometimes that can uh, have the flip side in terms of distancing, because in terms of saying, well, hey, I don't really know that, that, I don't really know that stuff, and we make that assumption that we need to do this because this, this person's Māori or Pacific or whatever, but we need to do it in a way that connects, connects with where they are so that we bring them along, um, I suppose, in a way that, that supports their understanding. And, and connects to the co-papa, but I think um, yeah, there's definitely potential, and there's probably uh, a lot of sorry, some music going off in the background here. Um, potential to tap into our local stories. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, Tim. Um, Nicola, just drawing you into this conversation. Mm. Um, I think, with you know, at risk of stating the obvious, most families um, that are experiencing violence are not likely in the first instance to reach out to a specialist family violence agency. Um, so we've recognised increasingly the importance of um, specialist family violence agencies providing a holistic response, which means that they need somehow to bring a broader range of uh, capabilities and service options um, to provide that holistic response. Um, but how do we connect with the vast majority of families that and not just about to, to, to reach out or engage with the stopping uh, with the specialist um, type of violence agency. And that's why I do, you know, still advocate for the model of a co-located practice that has been developed um, at the loft uh, in Christchurch um, that, you know, provides access to an enormously broad range of health, social and community services through just one front door. So that may mean that, you know, the primary need is clothing or it may be that you know power is just about to be cut off um, uh, uh, or, or, or it may be um, that um, you know there's needs some assistance with food or traveling or whatever if we can engage with people on their most fundamentally important matter right here right now without necessarily um, doing so as a family violence agency but as a holistic one-stop shop we um, increase our possibilities connecting with people and safely initiating conversations about safety um, much more so than we otherwise uh, could expect to do if we were just expecting or waiting for people to come to specialist um, family violence agencies. Thanks Nicola. Um, Jane did you want to add anything here? No. Um, I'm going to drag you in Jane because the next uh, question has been posed to you. 
Um, so um, we've been hearing a lot about of talk about violence and intervention programs. What about early intervention when families are vulnerable? And I suppose this um, moves directly on from what Nicola was just talking about, um, how we know about the stresses of, um, of um, from vulnerability to the impact of violence. Mm. I think one of the things I just want to start with is the idea, I remember once I was in a panel and they were talking about building strength and resilience. And, and so when I'm always asked about vulnerability, I think, um, you know, what we need to do is get rid of the vulnerability. <laughs> I mean, that is early intervention. So early intervention is, is looking at our structures and saying, you know, right now, uh, we have child poverty. Uh, so if, if we want to reduce family violence, we have to address some of these deep-seated issues that we have as a society, like child poverty. Um, so I think that's on a, uh, on a societal level when we're talking about uh, prevention of violence. And so what we want to do is not we want to prevent vulnerability <laughs> not just prevent uh, uh, violence. So I think that's one point. I think the second point was um, Michael mentioned uh, the, the children. And I think any time when there's violence and vulnerabilities and we bring communities in to support the children, we are doing early intervention. And we are looking to what the next generation is going to have. So I think uh, certainly that focus on strengthening families around children uh, is, is very uh, useful in going forward. So if that means, so when there is violence among partners, adults in a home, uh, asking the questions about the children, looking at the entanglement of the children, and and putting putting strengths uh, in the family to reduce the violence, uh, and looking to the children, I think is is a, a promising early intervention. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jane. Um, given Michael, given uh, Jane just referenced you, would you like to pick up the conversation? I actually think Jane did it. I mean, combining what Jane and Nicola just said, I love the idea, and I've seen this work really well, where it's about having an opportunity to start the conversation. I've seen this when I've visited Tim's work as well. Rather than just having a program where someone's referred to, if we could have initiatives that could increase dialogue and in a safe way, so, so people can come and raise issues and um, ask for help in a gentle, supportive way. Um, that would be great. The barriers to this, though, is the family, the whānau I work with, are extremely terrified of the role of oranga tamariki. So we need another discussion around when someone asks for help, how can that happen without an immediate um, referral to Oranga Tamariki, for instance? And I think we, we, we as a, a nation or professional body, we need to understand those fears more. Thanks, Michael. Um, Tim, did you want to add to that at all? Um... Yeah, just I was just thinking one of my other questions here was around the inclusion of the children's voice actually and I and I just think one of the things is one of the risks I think in those of us who work with the adults is that we lose sight of that in the in the work and how um, as has been covered before in our conversation earlier around making sure that all the parts of the puzzle connection and all 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 members of the family are being um, supported in a way that, you know, brings a, you know, truly holistic whānau approach, I suppose. And often uh, for us that work mainly with men and I suppose mainly with perpetrators, it's the first connection is trying to make sure something's happening with the partner or the person who's the victim or survivor in that space. But then the next step around that is what's happening with the children. And that's often um, 
not necessarily overlooked, but it's not necessarily connected as well. And like Mike said, you know, the risk that people have and the fear that family have is that I, once we start talking about that, then all and some of the key and those ones get involved. So I, I might not actually tell you really what's happening because I'm worried about what you might do with that information, you know. And, and just to touch on Jane's point around um, one of my other hats is working on the Final Resilience Project, actually, and that's looking at what builds that outside systems and services. And, you know, a lot of whānau tap into things within their own kind of um, circles, I suppose, that, um, that actually are building that and building that in a way that prevents, you know, them falling over when things do get tough. So I think we need to enhance more of that space as well. Thanks, Tim. Um, Nicola, I just want to invite you on if you've got anything to add. Um, yeah, I was just reminded of um, an initiative that, just acknowledging a you know, historical conflict of interest that um, Aviva um, uh, was developing that was based on um, the principles of peer support um, um, and developing uh, community capability and community resilience. There's an initiative that um, some of you may be familiar with, um, many of the listeners will be called Mental Health First Aid, which is about um, building capability within neighborhoods um, to be able to recognize and provide an appropriate supportive response to people that are experiencing um, distress, mental health distress. And um, Aviva has developed a similar initiative that looks at supporting um, uh, far no, anybody who identifies as important in a relationship with children, um, could be early childhood educators, uncles, aunts, to um, understand what child safety is, what it looks like, what it doesn't look like, um, and how they might initiate conversations uh, with people within their neighbourhoods, within their far no, um, about child well-being. Um, so it's a, a model of earlier um, intervention, and it is about recognizing that the vast majority of concerned conversations, potential conversations about child wellbeing actually sit within the community. Um, and as a model of earlier intervention, if we could develop the capability, the confidence, the skills of uh, communities to um, hold that, um, then we intervene earlier and de-escalate the need for um, statutory um, involvement. Um, so those principles of, you know, mental health first aid, very much um, very strong evidence based to support them within that sector. And I think that that kind of could is something that we can look to as well in our space. Thanks, Nicola. Um, that, uh, there's an, another question here that um, we originally had posed to Jeremy, but who unfortunately couldn't join us. Um, that I might just seek all of your responses on because it kind of draws from uh, the discussions we were just having. Um, and the question is, um, I can hear from the presenters that the responses need to be timely and appropriate. Um, do you think this is happening right now or what steps do you, need, do you think need to be taken so that this can occur? The issue of timing raise con raises concerns if you're waiting for the time to be right for the perpetrator to come forward for support um, and issues around whether or not that compromises the safety of the family in the meantime and how, how do we recon reconcile those um, those two pressures. Um, Tim, can I pose that to you first? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, just I suppose one of the learnings for us from timing is that one of the things that we notice is that um, it takes there's quite a number of barriers, of course, for men asking for help. You know, and the first question you asked me around masculinity was one of the one of the areas around that. You know, it's. Uh, the whole stigma around coming to a place like ours, even though we've done our best efforts not to uh, be a reinvention of, of some things. But, you know, it's some, talking to some of the men, you know, they've taken a couple of weeks to, they've walked past our door for a couple of weeks before summoning up the courage to come upstairs. And, um, and when they do that, we realise that we've got to capture that moment because if we don't, you know, good chance that they'll think, oh, no, that's not for me. And we've had that before where... Um, for some reason there wasn't somebody available to talk to them and to hear them at that moment and they might have filled out a form and given the details and then they often don't don't connect. So I think it is um, being able to respond at the time when they are asking for help and you know if that's the idea of the 
awareness campaigns is that people, you know, one of the, I think that one of the goals is that you see them and think, actually, yeah, no, I need to do something about this. Now, where do I go? And, you know, we talked about on the webinar, those need, places need to be obvious and they need to be accessible and available. Um, and then the other side of it, when you talked about balancing uh, safety, I think that really, um, when safety is compromised, then we need to, there's some just definite steps that we all have to take, you know, to make sure people are safe, you know. So it's not necessarily saying we won't worry about safety while we wait for this guy to turn the light bulb on, but, but, but when those men are turning those light bulb, well, I'm talking for the men because that's the most of the people that we work in in, the, in this space, when those light bulbs are turned on and where they do want to reach out, we need to make those places obvious and accessible and so we can capture that moment, I think, and, and get started. Um, yeah. If that answered the question, sorry. Yeah, perfectly, actually. Thank you, Tim. Um, Nicola, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I think the thing that sort of came to mind in listening to Tim and in, in thinking about my own experiences is, um, you know, the, the question of motivation. Um, which is often raised and you know motivation is questioned if people for example um, uh, begin a program because you know they've been referred through the judicial system uh, I think it's fundamentally the responsibility of professionals to motivate um, you know it's for us to instill hope it's for us to instill a sense of possibility and alternative um, this idea that we have to wait to somebody to reach rock bottom um, is unprofessional from my perspective, but also unsafe. We, we have to be reaching out with an irresistible proposition, you know, a sense that is articulated through um, our own word um, that, that there is really potential and hope and, and opportunity. And I sort of find it a little bit difficult to sort of articulate that myself because I'm sort of feeling it. But this idea that, you know, we have to, um, uh, you know, hold men uh, accountable and wait for them to accept responsibility and then engage with us, it, it's, 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 it's fundamentally lacking in what we say is important, which is Manaki uh, Tanga Araha, um, and earlier intervention. Um, and that's why I think that one of our biggest challenges as a sector, individually, and I think many of us are experiencing this as we journey through the Black Lives Matter opportunity, um, is the need for us to go through a process, a journey of you know, emotional intelligence and self-evaluation ourselves. Um, uh, you know, there is so much, um, implied and enacted um, power within um, our services and our structure and the relationships that we offer to people. And some of it is explicit, some of it, as I say, is implied. But um, I think that's a real fundamental challenge, a real fundamental challenge for us. I could go on for this, go on about this for ages and be, you know, become even less articulate than I'm being now. But I think that it is fundamental to, to the mindset and the belief system um, that has the potential to really drive change um, across the sector. Thanks, Nicola. Um, Michael, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and um, I guess if we could imagine cutting an onion in half and there are many layers to the onion, there's the programmatic level, um, maybe somewhere near the middle. As we go out, though, I've seen huge success um, through programs such as It's Not Okay campaign at a local level, where people like Vic Tamati, Phil Paikia come in, um, and they, I guess, in a way, they're doing consciousness raising, um, where they come and talk about their journeys of transformation. So that's another, just, I'm just saying there are many strings to the bow, and community-based action I, is really, I, I've seen so much success from it. And, and maybe it's because it gives people a common language where they can talk about pain, talk about violence, non-violence. No one really understands why it works, but, but it does work for different parts of our communities. And I think this is a, um, a real opportunity for more funding and um, yeah, for the government to actually do this at, at our community level. 
I've got to say too, there's a real risk that, you know, earlier that we talked about Maori models. Um, and this is not a question that was posed, but our white middle class uh, men with problems with violence can so easily go hidden. So while we're talking about early intervention and we're talking about making sure there's food on the table through food banks and electricity and stuff, we also need to include the conversation about the white middle class person who has a problem with violence who doesn't come across those, um, necessarily come across those sorts of avenues. Because at the moment they are underrepresented in our statistics. Um, but we know very much, of, of course they're there. And this is again a, a, a part, another part of the conversation that we really, really need to have. How we can access these parts of our communities that go are uh, currently under the radar. Sorry for going off point there, Pauline. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a really important point. If I could just add something to that. Um, the, the, the partners or, or, or former partners of um, those white middle class men who use violence may be more likely to engage um, with services. Um, and you know, we talked in the seminar uh, briefly about a massive service gap, which is for young people. Um, and I think that you know, in response to uh, that point, um, the need to develop appropriate um, supports for uh, um, young white men, um, amongst others, um, to try and break that intergenerational cycle um, is something that needs to be attended to. Uh, Jane, did you want to add anything to that conversation? I, I have to admit, I um, strongly agree with you. It's, I think it's an area that we need to explore some more um, and do some more work around. Um, I'm conscious that we're um, coming to the end of, of our allocated time for this. Um, and I think, though we might not have touched on everybody's question, just to, I'm looking at the questions um, on my screen, and I think that the conversation has sort of traversed the, um, the, the breadth of questions that we got posed. Um, there was uh, one final one that I guess it would be nice to wrap up on um, and I think Michael you've already touched on this and actually probably all of our panellists have already touched on this um, but it might be useful just as, as something to finish on um, and the question goes I'd love to hear of anywhere that services are meeting the needs of the community um, and it's talking about models of engagement um, are there any places you can offer as great models of engagement for Fano? Um, within which violence is used and or for men using violence and what programs do you think are impactful for our Tane and what makes them so? Um, and I guess that that sort of has that broader question that um, tends to be the million dollar question for a lot of the people who are watching the webinar which was what does success look like and do we have a picture of that at present? Um, so final um, remarks on that would be awesome. Um, Jane, you've been really quiet. Can I bring you in on this? <laughs> I, th I think I'm quiet because uh, I think our webinar, we really wanted to hear from community and it, it's, it is we're community. So I'm going to defer to them again uh, because uh, that's, what, that's where it's happening and that's, we have to listen. So uh, yeah, I'll pass my time over. We'll hmm. see. Okay, Nicola, <laughs> I'll bring you on then. <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I would imagine that, you know, the, most, the vast majority of services and organisations um, are contributing a degree of success um, to the community. The question is what, um, what models of practice can really optimise um, that success. And if we look at the challenges that families face, difficulties in accessing uh, services, the complexity of challenges, um, the coexisting range of challenges that families need, I am still going to say that from my perspective a model that does need um, does warrant further um, exploration and development um, is is the loft um, as an early model of co-located integrated practice in Christchurch um, it you know it, it has it undergone an evaluation um, so there is some research evidence there it worked closely we work closely with uh, the New Zealand um, 
Institute of Economic Research, I might have got that name slightly wrong, but to develop um, a research evaluation framework. Um, so, you know, it's a model um, that is very much grounded in research evidence, it is generating evidence and it has a robust evaluative framework there to support it. Um, very much aligned with um, government uh, policy rhetoric, um, child poverty, um, one-stop shops, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I would say that, wouldn't I? Great, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Michael. Um, so I'm very much a systems person. I completely agree with Nicola. Um, and yeah, I've visited the loft, it's amazing. Um, I think when I'm work, working with communities, they, they want a model that they can take and change it and alter it according to their own location. Don't, you know, not a one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, again, I'm not answering your question. There's a real opportunity to develop a case study approach of some models, a selection of models that are working in Aotearoa. And so that, that could be a, like a toolbox, um, a toolkit for communities to look at and um, see how they may be able to do it for themselves. Um, that said, uh, uh, when I have worked with communities, the things that are working, as Nicholas says, is a systems approach that is multi-leveled, which um, works with the whānau, always keeping in mind our babies, our children, um, that is not short term, that is there for the duration for as long as the Fano require it, but also provides, um, makes sure that people's basic needs are met from, and one thing we didn't talk about is alcohol and other drug addiction, gambling addiction, and making sure that people have a, um, a roof over their heads. So when I talk about a systems approach, it includes all of that as a holistic um, package. Yep. Sure. Tim, means you get the final word. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I suppose um, all of us that work, like Nicola said, there's, there's heaps of people. People don't do this work to not make a difference. And I think there's pockets of excellence across Aotearoa and, and a lot of communities. And a lot of them actually under the radar. You know, I was interested to see uh, there was a great, uh, story about Ghani Nevis the other week and the police minister said we should have one of these in every community and I'd encourage the police minister, minister to look outside his front door actually because <laughs> there's examples of that in all communities not uh, not not the same as Ghani Nevis and not the same as Tawapi and not the same as Aviva but there are examples of actually excellence and I and I would hope that those in government um, would actually, you know, step outside and have a look and actually talk. Like Michael said, you know, there's a there's an opportunity to to go around. I mean, I've been invited to a number of places at times to say what we do at Tawapi here. And while while this model works for our community and works in a way for a number of our men, it won't necessarily fit every community, you know, because we do have um, demographic differences, you know, and, and other differences that means that. Um, whatever happens needs to be responsive to the needs of the people that are there. And I think, like touching on what Mike said as well, in terms of um, stepping away from a program approach to a program of action. And, and, and you know, I just wanted to put a, a, a play, plug in here. We've mentioned Safe Men, Safe Family here, I suppose, and that's um, come out of Vic Tamati's own journey. And it's really a community framework in response to support for men, which includes a whole range of things, which uh, um, a program, peer support model, uh, respite accommodation, um, long-term timeout facilities, a safe space, and all of those things. And um, it's an example of a yeah more holistic approach where, like, like Mike and Nicholas said, it's sort of covering all the bases and, and looking at rather than just the one person that presents through your door for that one co-papa, um, what's behind um, their their context of that of that behaviour and, and that journey, but also the connections uh, across their family and you know, um, like Vic says, you know, how do you know the man is safe? The family will tell you. But how often do we check in with the family around that safety? You know, so it's um, looking at the whole picture. Mm. But it needs to fit. Um, yeah, with with the localised 
and community approach is really. And I think, you know, over the years, we've all met probably people from around the country who are doing really awesome work with whatever they've got, you know, but it's often not necessarily connected to other people in the country. And there's not, not a strong community of practice, I think, in, in, in the family, kind of the family violence sector across capturing everybody who works in, connected to the system and outside the system as well, I think. Mm. Kia ora, thank you very much, Tim. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I want to thank every one of you. I also want to thank our other panellists who were with us on the day. Um, so Dennis Grinnell, um, Fiona Cram and um, Jeremy Eparaima. Um, I um, acknowledge all the hard work that all of you do and I'm immensely grateful for your contributions. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks.